I had no clue what to do. I was brand new. Uh, this never experienced something like this before. I was going to a nursing home with a student ministry group to, to go and to interact with the residents and visit them and, and try to cheer them up a little bit. And, and I'd never gone and visited a nursing home just, just where I'd have a one-on-one interaction with a patient that I didn't know, that wasn't a family member or a family friend. And so I didn't know what to do. And so I, I sought out the student pastor named Brian, and I'm like, Brian, I, I don't know what to do. And he's like, just follow my lead. I'm like, all right, perfect. So he and I walked into the room of an, of an elderly woman, and he walked over, and she raised her hand, and, and he put his hand in her hand, and he said, hi, my name's Brian, and if it's all right with you, we'd just like to come by and, and visit you. And she's like, oh, absolutely, that would be great. And he sat down at her right hand, and there was another seat open on her left hand, and I went to, to sit down, and she caught my arm. And she started, she started squeezing my hand a little bit. And uh, she said, come here. And so I went, in to, I went in to give her a hug, and her face kept moving closer to mine. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And her face just kept moving closer to mine. And at the last second, I like turned my lips away, and she started making out with my cheek. I mean, I'm talking, there, there was tongue between her lips circling on my cheek, and I'm looking over at Brian, and he's losing it. He's laughing hysterically, and she's got a death grip on my face. I can't, I can't escape. This wasn't how the dreams went of, of, of women grabbing me and kissing me. This wasn't, this wasn't what I had ever envisioned in my life. It looked very different than this. And I finally got away, and there, like my face was wet. <laughs> and so I, I dried it off on, on my arm, and, and I excused myself out into the hall and as soon as as soon as Brian finished up with her, he came out and he just started laughing. He doubled over and he was crying. He was laughing so hard. And I'm just like, I don't really know what to do with this. <laughs> He's like, just be glad people want to kiss you, man. <laughs> you know, in times of uncertainty, when we don't know when we don't know what to do, we find it comforting when we find somebody who's been there before. We find it comforting to be able to talk to somebody. This morning, we're going to continue our look at a letter that a guy named Paul wrote to a church that he used to pastor, but he still loved very much. It was a church in the town of Corinth, and we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and they got a lot of things right in that church, and they got a lot of things wrong, and there's lessons for us to learn in all of that. And this morning, we're going to look at at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 11, and then we're going to jump down to the middle half of the chapter, and we're going to continue looking at, at some words that he wrote this morning, but just, just want to start with the first verse where he writes this, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ, meaning live your life in such a way that when people look at you, what they see is not you they see Jesus. That when people look at you, they don't see you, but they see Jesus through you. Our world is going crazy right now. And we live in, in always we live in an uncertain time, but, but now more so than maybe, maybe ever. I, I know for some of you who've lived through world wars that you, you can reference that point in time or the JFK assassination, certainly September, the terrorist attacks on September 11th, which, which I was old enough to remember. And, and now the, the coronavirus has just crippled our country. And there is a time of fear and uncertainty and concern, and there is a healthy level of that, and there is a level of paranoia of which we've only experienced on those rare occasions People just don't know what to do. And there's just vast uncertainty. 
So our response needs to start with this. With first, those of us who follow Jesus need now more than ever to have Jesus be able to be seen through us. That now more than ever, the stakes are high. And so now more than ever, when people look at us, they need to see love. When people look at us, they need to see hope. And when people look at us, believe it or not, for those of us who follow Jesus, they can see peace. Because while there is fear and while there's uncertainty, and it's not unbiblical to experience those emotions, and it doesn't mean you're not spiritual enough if you're experiencing some of those things. The truth is this, that we are rooted in a hope that is bigger than our circumstance. We are rooted in a hope that is bigger than our understanding. We are rooted in a hope of while we are uncertain, we serve a God who is certain. While we are shaken, we serve a God who is unshaken. While we have no answers, we serve a God who has the answers. While we can't offer any peace, we serve a God who has already offered us peace. And now more than ever, people need to see Jesus through us. But right now what I want to do is I just want to pause. And I want us collectively to just cry out to God. From where we're seated in our hearts, and there will be just, just momentary quiet in this room. But collectively, I want us just to pray. Yes, that we would be the example of Jesus. Yes, that God in his mercy would would stave off this pandemic. Yes, that there would be medical breakthroughs. Yes, that we would not miss this opportunity. But also for us, individually. If you're here and you're scared, it's okay to be scared. If you're here and you're uncertain, so is everyone else. But don't lose sight of the hope that you have. And in the quietness of this moment, I just want us to, number one, celebrate that hope in a time where we just confess to God that we don't have the answers, but He does, to receive that grace and that goodness and to cry out for him to work. So I invite you to pray right now. God, we give you our uncertainties. We give you our fears. We give you our anxieties. We ask you to take them and to remind us that you are greater. We ask, God, that you would allow there to be a breakthrough very soon. We ask that you would reveal to us opportunities to love and serve others. That we would be the radiant picture that you designed us to be as your followers. That the hope that we have in you would be conveyed to all in the ways that we conduct our lives. And God, that we could rest. That we could rest in the peace of knowing you. So we give this to you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray.
Amen. So we shoot down halfway through the chapter now into verse 17, where we read these words. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. But in the following things, I don't commend you. Because when you come together, you're actually doing more harm than good, the Apostle Paul writes. He, basically what he's saying is, here's the problem. I don't like to be around you. I don't like to be around you. Now, check this out. They're still Christians. They're still followers of Jesus. He didn't like them. It doesn't mean that they're going to hell. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. God loves them. Everybody else just thinks they're jerks, right? I mean, that's essentially what he's just said. And, and some of you may know somebody like that, or if you're like, hmm, can't think of anybody like that, it's because it's you. But, there, you know, Jesus, Jesus loves you, just nobody else does. That's fine. And, and what Paul's saying here is he's like, I don't, I, don't really like to, I don't really like to be around you. They're still Christians. We're all, we're all like batteries, Every single one of us, we're all like batteries. And, and what happens is when we get run down and when there isn't margin in our lives, and this is a whole series we can do sometime, but when, when we don't have proper margin in our lives, we don't make good decisions, people don't like to be around us, we don't like to be around people, when we, when we have things out of bounds and we're not resting like we should rest, and, and we don't have a proper perspective on life and we're, we're working constantly or we're going home to a situation that's just not fun to be around and it's draining. We're all like batteries. And each of us has a capacity. And each of us has a capacity. And what happens is we need to be around other people and we need to find that group of people that recharge us as individuals. We need to find that group of people that just bring us so much joy to be around that you can just laugh and you can be yourself. And at the end of the night, you're like, I am so glad. I am so glad we went through the hassle of finding a sitter. I'm so glad we went through the hassle of, of whatever it took so that we could just hang out and be with these people. And it just it's life-giving and it fills you up and you have to find those people. And similarly, you're going to have people in your life that every time they're around you, they're a ministry. Every time they're around you, they are just draining. And you know, you know the person. As soon as I say it, it immediately comes to mind. So you're just like, oh, every time I'm around that person, it just drains the life out of me. As soon as you see the text flash on the phone, you're like, I'll respond to that later. Because just seeing the notification of that person, just seeing the notification, that right, right there, you're just like, hey, uh, <laughs> all right, well, that's a drainer. Put that one away for a while. As soon as you see the notification, as soon as you see the notification, you're like, oh, this person is just, just a drainer. And here's, here's the thing. Am I saying you need to eliminate those people from your lives? No, absolutely not. I'm not saying that. Should you marry that person? No, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. And some of you have. Some of you have married that person, and now you're regretting it, right? And you're like, I, listen, what he's saying is true. Do, you're, you're in love now. Do not marry that person. Because, because it's just exhausting constantly. And we all have that capacity. But we have to find people that just refill us, they recharge us, and aren't people that just constantly drain us. And what Paul's saying here is, you guys are a bunch of drainers in this regard. You're a bunch of, I don't, I don't like being around you. I don't, I don't like being around you because you've got some serious faults that you need to address. Now, we would look at that. Some people would look at that and be like, oh, how dare him? How dare him? He didn't praise me. He didn't say that everything I do is great. And that's our, natural, that's our natural reaction. Because all of us love, we all love to be praised. It feels good. Every single one of us loves it. 
Now, some more than others, based on how you're wired and how much affirmation you need. But all of us love compliments. That's universal. Everyone loves to be complimented. And so some people would look at this and be like, how dare him? How dare him go and address something that needs to be addressed? And yet, why is he doing it? Because he loves the church and he loves the people. In your criticism, in your criticism, understand that criticism needs to be rooted in love. It needs to begin in love. And if you're just a natural critic of somebody who flies off the handle and criticizes everything, then the reason it's not received well is because people fail to see how that's rooted in love. But if you critique because you care about the person and you desire what's best for them, it's not going to be easy and it's not always going to go over well, but it's rooted in the right thing. And that's the biblical model that we see here. And now we're going to see what it is about them that made him not want to hang out with them. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Check that out. He's saying you're divided. And I believe that I believe that there's that division. You know why there's that division? Because some of you are fake. Because some of you are fake. He says you're divided, you're not unified, and the reason for that is because some of you are genuine. Some of you are the real deal, and some of you are fake. Some of you, it's all a show, and that shows up through time. It becomes very clear through time who that person is. You're divided, and the reason that you're divided is because you aren't authentic, because you're fake. And how does this manifest itself? When you come together, verse 20 says, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. He's saying you have a communion ritual. You have a communion ritual. But what should unite ultimately divides. This morning, in a, in a few minutes, we're going to take communion. And it's a beautiful picture that Jesus told the church to continue to observe. And the picture is this, that God loves us. And every time we take communion, it's to be a reminder. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, this whole idea can can seem kind of foreign to you because it's something that you don't understand yet. And by God's grace, we hope one day you'll come to the point where you do understand it and make the decision to give your life to follow Jesus. But if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, this this doesn't make sense. You're like... Thanks for, you know, a little finger food and a little thimble full of juice. Woo! Thank you. That'll tie me over for two seconds. Awesome. So what's the, what's the point behind it? What's the point behind it? It's a beautiful picture to, to remember, to remember what Jesus did for us on our behalf. And here's the thing. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, Whether you grew up in the area or whether you're a transplant, it doesn't matter. Whether you're a male, whether you're a female, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because communion is something that unites us. It unites us. Because in all our differences, there is one universal truth. In all our differences, there's one universal truth. That we have the need for a Savior. That I can't do it on my own. That I am incapable of measuring up to God's standard. Because that standard is perfection. And some of you, you may be good. Some of you may be really, really good. Like if we were to pull, to, to pull this room, people would point at you and be like, you are really, really good. Others of us like me, we're all in on the grace thing. Because we're like, you know what? Yeah, I'm not measuring up. (laughs) I just know the things I think. I know the things that fly out of my mouth sometimes. And yep, I'm not there. But I'm still not that guy, right? 
I mean, we could always, there's, all of us could always point at Baxter. There's always Baxter, right? And so there's, there's always hope for all of us. There is hope for all of us. And we're like, well, we've always got that guy that we know we're not that bad. But we also have that person that we have to point to and be like, hmm, we don't measure up to them either. And this is God's scale, not that you're good enough, that you have to live in fear of something that, that's always changing, and whether or not you can do just enough to skate by. The message of the gospel of Jesus is, you can't. You can't. Because God's standard is perfection. It's pass or it's fail, and you failed. And that's universal. And that should unite us all in the fact that we have a desperate need for a Savior. And yet, in spite of the fact that we all failed, in spite of the fact that none of us measured up to God's standard, God still loves us anyways. Just like when your kids don't measure up to your standard. A good father and a good mother aren't like, well, you're a failure. Get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. You're out. Like, Dad, I'm four. Well, you got to learn sometime, kid. Life's rough. Nobody's going to give you anything in this life. Good luck. No. You want to make a way for them to continue to experience relationship. That's what God did on our behalf. He continued a way for us to experience relationship in spite of the fact that every single one of us blew it. So he came to this world and he died on a cross because the cost of our sin is death. And so Jesus paid that price on our behalf. And communion is the picture of that sacrifice. It is to recenter us. It is to refocus us individually as we'll see in a moment. Absolutely. That it recenters our life and it calls us to pause and to reflect on the goodness and the grace of God. But also corporately and collectively, it recenters us in saying it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your gender. What brings us together and what unites us in a world that constantly tries to divide us is this universal truth that there is a God who loves you and who paid the price for you. And bigger than anything else in the world, this one thing unites us together. And he's getting on the church because he's like, that's not going on. That's not going on with you. You have a communion ritual, but what should unite everybody is actually dividing everybody. Instead, there's, there's one person, and they eat everything, and then there's the other group, and they have nothing, and they eat nothing. So all the rich people who, who brought all the food sit down at a table with all the other rich people, and they feast. And all the poor people who didn't have anything to bring into the church walk into the church, and they leave the church hungry. It's like you're divided. There's no reason for that. You need to be united around the one thing that unifies us all, the sacrifice of Jesus. He continues in verse 22. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. He's like, can't you eat at home? Can't you have your feast at home? I'm not saying you shouldn't have a feast, but can't you at least do it out, out, of, out of reverence for everybody else and, and just say, hey, we're, we're going to do this at our house rather than bring it in the church, flaunt it in front of everybody, and then have the members-only club at one table that nobody else is allowed to join in? He said, you've turned what should be a reminder about the universal need that each of us has for Jesus. You've turned what should be a reminder about God's incredible grace. You've turned all of that into a situation to promote yourself. You've taken the focus off Jesus where it belongs and instead turned it on you. He says, I'm, 
I'm not going to congratulate you on that. You're not bigger than the mission. You're not more important than the purpose. So I'm going to call you out on it. That's what he says. And he says, I, I'm, I'm not commending you. And here's why. Here's why this really, really matters. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread is a picture of Jesus' body being broken because my body should be broken. And so that my body wasn't broken, Jesus' body was broken. And every time we meet and have communion, the bread is a reminder of God's body being torn apart because of my shortcomings, because of my sin, because of my failures. The broken body of Jesus. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The wine or the juice is a picture of the blood of Jesus. The, the God literally poured out his blood for you and for me. God's work is done with the death of Jesus, with his body being broken, with his blood poured out, Jesus cried out, it is finished. God's work of our redemption is done, proving that it was victorious and accepted by God three days later when he rose again. God's work is done, but God is not done working. God's work is done, but God is not done working. And so when we eat the bread and when we take the cup, it reminds us of the finished work of Jesus. As he cried out on the cross, it is finished. The debt of my sin, the debt of my mistakes, the debt of my faults have been paid in full. That is done. And yet communion also should not only be a reminder, but it should spur us on to remember that while God's work is done, God is not done working. And God primarily works through his word. And what tools does he use? You and me. The scripture is the revealed heart of God. And we are called to be salt and light to this world. And so when we take communion, it unifies us. It reminds us of what really matters. What's really important. And why what we do is so important. And that's the work of communion corporately, that it reminds us all that we are unified in the need for a Savior, and it should spur us on to understand that the work of God is done, but God's not done working. But what about individually? Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. He says, listen, take inventory of your life before you do this. 
Take inventory of your life before you do this. This isn't just something that you do without giving it any thought. No, 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 no. This, this really matters. Take inventory of your life before you do this. There is a supernatural significance behind this practice. Is, is, do, do we believe that the bread and the juice are, are supernatural? No, we, we believe that they're representations. But there is supernatural significance behind this practice. Then he says, for those of you who've done it flippantly, for those of you who haven't put any thought in it, for those of you who are treating other people like garbage, check this out. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. The result of not being honest with where and who we are is God's judgment and discipline. I know there's things going on in your life. There's things going on in my life that every single one of us would say, I want to work on that. I I need to, I need to, I need to improve. And it doesn't mean that because those things in our lives are there that we shouldn't take communion. That's not what this is talking about. Instead, what this is talking about is the things that are glaring in our lives that we're no longer even trying to work on. That we know that there are elements in our lives that don't agree with what God says needs to happen in those elements, but we just don't care. We just don't care. And rather, rather than yield our will and our approach to God's will and God's approach, we're just like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And Jesus will have to be cool with that. So I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to follow Jesus on my terms, and my life's going to look however I want my life to look like. And then he says, you're living very dangerously. Because following Jesus requires us all to elevate Jesus. That at the heart of following Jesus, we all would echo the prayer of a guy named John the Baptist who said, Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. And when we no longer try to have our life look like God wants our life to look, we're in danger. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. He says this, church, be united. Be united around the fact that we all need Jesus. Be united about that fact. We have rich people, we have poor people, we have middle class people. We have people who were born in Algoma, we got people who were born all over the region. We even have some people who were born in Michigan. God still loves you. We're trying, we're trying. Right? We're trying. We have men, we have women, you name it. There are a number of things that could divide us. And it's not like we have to erase all our differences. We need to focus on that which unites us. And this, this is one of those things that serves that purpose. That collectively, It gives us a chance and a moment to just say, we might be the most different people ever. But I just love the fact that we can worship Jesus together. It gives us a moment to look in our hearts and ask the question, is everything in my life where it needs to be? It takes us all back. It takes us all back to the fact that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And that's our hope. And in a time that's trying, like right now, that's our hope. That's our peace. That we serve a God who loves us and is greater than all of this. And He's in control. He's got us. 
It's our hope when things are going great. To remind us that we need Jesus then. It's our hope when our world is caved in. To remind us we're not alone. Most importantly, we have God. We also have each other. And so we invite you today. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. The band's going to come up. We're going to pass out communion. We put the crackers in cups. So people who've been sneezing or coughing or who knows what else this week, picking their nose, whatever else is going on, they're not going to be touching your, they're not going to be touching your cracker. All right? It's in a cup. So just take a cup of a cracker, take a cup of juice, look at your life, make sure, there's, make sure that you're on the path to making sure your life looks like Jesus wants your life to look like. And if not, in the quietness of this moment or while the band sings, you just confess something to God. And let's be united in the fact that there is a universal need. Jesus made it possible that we could have a relationship with God. God, I pray that we would be people who live our lives in such a way that people could look at us and see you. I pray that every person in this room would have people in their lives that recharge them, that refill them. And every person in this room would work at being a person who when others are around, recharges others and refills them. God, I pray that we would just be unified in our universal need for you. And I pray individually we'd all look inside and make sure our lives look like you want them. God, help us be hope to those who are hopeless by pointing them to the one hope that is you. Thank you for your sacrifice. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.